Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Jabroni Drive. My name is Tom Lavelle, and as always, I'm accompanied by Mr. Timothy Schmidt. On this week's episode, Ray Wyatt, Terry Funk, Seth Rollins, Shinsuke Nakamura, Becky Lynch, Trish Stratus, Rhea Ripley, Raquel Rodriguez, Ray Mysterio, Austin Theory, L.A. Knight, and The Miz. We're going to be talking about payback, the upcoming KLE. Timmy, anything you want to say to all the Schmidt Lavellites? Oh, my freaks out there. Big Papa Pump is your hookup. Holla if you hear me. I love it. <laughs> shot out to Scott Steiner there. Timmy, that might have been my my favorite one you've done yet. I think That's you had our about. audience sitting there in that Steiner recliner enjoying the hell out of that beginning of a show. Well, I mean, he is I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. He is uh, a wrestler that really had no boundaries um we're getting off topic i know and then we have a, a rundown that we have to follow but tom no scotty steiner was uh he was he was a guy that kind of moved the needle a little bit back in the day oh for sure dude and especially when there was a monday night wars and um he was out there big pop of pump he was one of the guys in nw or in wcw that i was like I was when he was on the TV, I was interested, you know what I mean? And moving the needle, like you said, when he's on, I'm not changing the channel. I want to see what Big Papa Pump's got to say, you know, because he was entertaining as hell and he was a monster. Maybe a little bit of a maybe a little juice there, you think? uh, A little bit, but I mean, he, I mean, self admittedly, he called himself a genetic freak. I mean, (laughs) the dude was absolutely ripped out of his mind. And uh, it was crazy because for a guy like me that used to watch the WWE and watch the Steiner brothers, I didn't ne- I could never put it together. Obviously, his name was Big Papa Pomp, but Scott Steiner. But like when I saw the difference between talk about it, like a change in character from where he was in WWE to what yeah. he became in WCW, that's like night and day. It was yeah. cool. And I was always more of like similar similar times, I'm guessing, but I was always more of a Rick Steiner fan when they were the Steiner brothers. I always kind of lead towards the dog face gremlin. Yeah. yeah. And I liked him. And lately, Timmy, I've been I've been checking out a lot of the old school Steiner brothers matches. And dude, if you want to talk about our style and hard hitting and like just ruthless, like beating the shit out of people. Go check out some old school Steiner's brothers matches because they're intense. I watched one with Sting and the great Muda over in Japan. And I mean, these guys were doing moves that I was like, how are they still walking? How are the wrestlers they face still walking? Hold on real quick. I sent you and the HAB a text today. Is Sting really 64 years old right now? I can't confirm or deny that. I know he's about that. Let's just uh, real quick, we'll we'll double check it right now. How old is Sting? Because I just saw a clip of him jumping off the top rope at 64 years old. He is 64 day. years old. Yes, he is. Dude, I mean, as much as I, it's not that I hate AEW, but um, apparently that's when this, this, feet of strengths took place yeah. and sting is always look sting has always been a he's sold out everywhere he's gone like it doesn't matter he's, he's one of big time he, he is one of the guys that will go down as as a guy that just has given everything to the business like uh like a dusty roads type right like yeah. that'll that'll go into wrestling infamy when he finally fucking retires but he's 64 years old Jumping off the top rope through two tables. I mean, dude, my dad can't even get out of his chair uh, right, right now. 
you know it, what? And he's an all time legend. And a lot of times when people talk about like the Mount Rushmores and this and that, I mean, obviously, if you're bringing up Mount Rushmore of WCW, he's probably the first name you mentioned, you know, and it's it's interesting what a legend he is. But when people talk about the greatest of all time, he's not really put on that mentioned. list. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I'm not saying that he is the greatest of all time, but he should get more more kudos, I'd say, especially for his longevity, the draw ability. You know, the guy, when I watched WCW back when I was little, I remember being like, man, I like that guy's sting, you know? You know, what's weird, though, too, is that he has a move that's called the, the Scorpion Deathlock, which yep. is the, the your favorite wrestler's Fred Hart's move. finishing, yeah. The, and the sharpshooter, same move. It's it's more known for being the sharpshooter than it is for the Scorpion Deathlock. Yet, I would say that Sting has been wrestling way longer than Bret Hart, right? Oh, well, yeah. Now, like, he's got so many years under his belt with... Well, I mean, how old was Bret Hart? How old did is Bret come, Hart? Did they come up at the same time? Sting was uh, definitely wrestling before Bret Hart was, right? No. Bret Hart, I, I would say, was wrestling before Sting. He's 66. So, I mean, right around the same time. But I, I think Bret was before him because Bret was a, like a collegiate wrestler, in, like kind of like the that style of wrestling. And his dad was the runner of a territory up in Canada, you know? So he was grown up with wrestling so brett brett's been doing it longer than that he started earlier than sting regard all right so i thought i thought that uh sting was older than than brett so that's not true but either way <laughs> sting's still doing it and it's yeah. incredible incredible that he's still I mean, we've gone way off topic by the way i'm sorry that's for fine it. dude hey that's what wrestling's all about and i'm glad you did because in the intro, um, first of all, I was naming off all these names, and I didn't mention KO, Sami Zayn, Finn, and Damian Priest in a match, which we're going to be talking about that later because there's just so many names to mention, and I was like, let's just get through it. Also, something that we should mention is AEW All In. I, I want to talk about that real quickly right now. Now, they had over 80,000 fans at Wembley Stadium. was a very good show. Um, I got to check it out while I was at the pool. You know, I said, I think Timmy was like, what the hell you're watching this? And, you know, you know, you're not even inviting your boys. And, you know, I, I checked out the main event and then kind of loosely followed on Twitter. This is this is more of a. WWE show, however, I want to give kudos to AEW for a being able to sell so many tickets, put on such an event and just note that anything that's good for AEW is just good for professional wrestling. In my heart, I'm always going to be a WWE guy. I'm cheering for WWE. I grew up with WWE. That's where like my loyalties lie. And I know maybe it seems like like contradictory to like what I want to be because I do cheer for the small guy and like like you know what I mean. I, I cheer for the underdog. But what's good for AEW is just good for professional wrestling as a whole. And it just shows how popular professional wrestling is right now that uh, a company that isn't WWE is putting over 80,000 people packing Wembley stadium. Incredible stuff. Well, I, I can I add to that real quick? Yeah, because, please. Um, As much as I am just a WWE guy, I saw a clip from this weekend um, and it was Kurt Angle talking about, his time at TNA and you forget about promotions like this, right. That are TNA and that, that not every wrestler is going to make it to the main roster in WWE and they still need places to go. And it's almost like a minor league type system, but they all, yeah, they all get compensate compensated for what they do. Um, which is it's, it's yeoman's work, dude. It's a, it's a rough road as a, as a, as a wrestler, you know, in trying to make it in the circuit. But Kurt Angle was talking about back in the day, like when he was at TNA, like they signed Hulk Hogan, they had Scott Hall and they had Sting and they had all these guys, right? And like they were drawing like 2 million views on Spike TV, which was like probably the height of 
what TNA ever was. Right. But like that's that's pretty impressive, right? When you're going up against big ticket, like these guys have to go somewhere and do something, right? Like if they don't make it in the WWE, they gotta go somewhere else. And um, you know, WWE is obviously the the NFL, if you will, if it was football of of wrestling. And then you have all these other promotions and AEW isn't I'm not saying it's not like it's a minor league situation there, but like they, they do have solid wrestlers. They have great, like we talked about MJF on, on the show a bunch of times. And we talked about FTR and all their tag teams and CM Punk. And like, he's over there. It's just, it, it's a good promotion, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole, whole world of, of wrestling out there that, that uh, is meant to entertain us, Tom. Yeah, and it's an exciting time to be a professional wrestling fan because there's so much good stuff out there and competition breeds the best, brings the best out of a lot of people and it certainly is bringing out the best WWE has been in a long time. And uh, kudos to AEW for such a successful weekend. Um, And, you know, let's see what WWE has to offer following that. So we're going to get into the build and the, the 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 card for payback. But before we do that, we have to mention two big losses in the world of professional wrestling this past week. First with Terry Funk and then the like the surprising, shocking loss of one Bray Wyatt. And Timmy, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about Bray Wyatt. I know like you're just kind of getting back into the fold and I think he's one of those characters that kind of catches everyone's eye and helps bring people into the fold. And if there's anything you'd like to say about Bray Wyatt, the floor is yours, buddy. Yeah, I'll keep it simple. Like from the time that I got back into wrestling and I've documented a bunch of times on the show that like, I'm fairly new to it, but I always like have been a fringe wrestling guy. I've always kept an eye on it. And seeing Bray Wyatt was uh he was like a different type of character and um I I saw a post from The Rock that I sent to you which was I think pretty spot on he said in a in a world of wrestling where it's hard to create an original character and I'm just paraphrasing here so I'm not quoting him um Bray Wyatt was able to do that. He was able to create somebody that you'd never really seen before. Um, someone that had different levels to his, to his character, right? You saw um, Bray Wyatt become just a different guy with like the fiend and like his character development. It was just really cool. And like one of the things I said to you and the HJB was that, in all my time watching wrestling, he had, besides The Undertaker, one of the coolest entrances that I have ever seen. Um, it's one of those spectacles that you want to be a part of. Like, just like with The Undertaker, like when he raised those lights, the lights dimmed down, right? It was like, dude, I was there when The Undertaker did this, right? Or... I was there when the fireflies appeared. Like I, I was never in a live arena when Bray Wyatt wrestled, but uh, I would imagine that it would be very similar to um, the experience that it is when you're in the arena, when the undertaker shows up and those lights go down. Um, it's a shame because he had so much potential and we've talked about him a handful of times on here about his return and, and what he would mean to WWE in the future. And, and I'm sad that we'll never see that because he had a lot of potential. Um, and he was just, he was just a creative dude. And, um, yeah, I saw a couple of videos of him interacting with fans in the, in the past with kids and stuff like that. And it's hard to watch because he seemed like just a great guy and he had like solid family and all that stuff. And I have to, uh, I'll yeah. pass it to you. Sorry. Yeah. I hear you. And, um, you know, 
it's 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 tough when I, whenever you see someone like that that's young like that, thirty six years old, and like Timmy, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of say what you were already saying. An original guy, definitely the best, I guess, kind of dark character to me since the Undertaker, and was the heir apparent at WrestleMania or at a uh, Raw thirty. Undertaker came out, saw Bray Wyatt, whispered something into his ear, and I think it was kind of a passing of the torch, and Bray was supposed to be the guy, and then there was a lot of speculation as to what was going on and where Bray was and all this other stuff, and come to find out, I guess he was a lot sicker than uh than was let out, and we knew, and, you know, I my heart goes out to him and his family and everyone out there. Bray Wyatt, fun fact, if you didn't know, his brother... Bo Dallas and his dad was uh Erwin R. Scheister, Mr. IRS. So um a lot of ties to the wrestling community, Bray Wyatt. Truly an original. R.I.P. to uh Wyndham Rotunda, his real name, Wynda Rotunda. Last he, thing, real quick. I'm sorry, yeah. Diane. No, go thing. ahead. Um he uh also, I I know for a fact that like he a lot of people had there was like some dismay towards him because like of his character and like how it was so eerily similar to the undertaker. And he made it clear that he was not trying to be the undertaker. And I think that's kind of what, what that last you mentioned raw 30. Like, I think the undertaker knew that or not knew, but like just made it clear, like, Hey, I know you're not trying to recreate me. Like, and I think the whole people that knew that character knew that he's not, that wasn't even close to what their undertaker was. So um, there was like a lot of fringe, like wrestling fans that thought that like they were, there were some similarities between the undertaker and Bray Wyatt. And uh, they were clearly different in my opinion. That's no, what I'm saying. I agree. And I mean, the only, I guess co- like, in common they had is they were both kind of these darker characters you know what i mean but besides that they were they were different worlds you know bray was on the mic and one of the best on the mic and just kind of telling his stories and doing his things and dude i'm upset that he's gone and i'm curious to know what their plans were for bray Wyatt. and i'm sure years from now it'll come out in some interviews and uh what the plans actually were because we've talked about where like the bloodline story is going was he supposed was bray supposed to be involved in the bloodline story you know what's going on with bobby lashley was bray supposed to be involved with this and that and mm-hmm. you know what was what was the plan for him and you know where where did the, all that stuff stop and so once once again we have another another person that passed away a legend and i'm gonna be and i and i hate to like be quick on this but terry funk passed away this year an absolute legend i love terry funk you know for all of us, in, especially in the Philadelphia area that are ECW fans, he was one of these guys that was a kind of that locker room leader in ECW, just the legend that all the other guys in there could kind of look up to. I think Paul Heyman brought him in strategically to kind of show the guys this is what a real worker is. And he's obviously a great promo, one of the all-time promos, one of the guys that was out there that w- 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 took took every risk and was, was, wasn't was afraid of anything He's had some all-time matches. If you haven't seen him with um, Ric Flair, they had they had a feud, like a, a trio of matches. I forget what year it was, but they were excellent, hard-hitting matches. I mean, you know, Terry Funk was a hardcore guy. Him and Mankind, a.k.a. Cactus Jack, had, had a great feud um, throughout their careers. Great friends they are. And, you know, some of the things that I remember is Terry Funk and ECW when – he he wins the title and and they're playing um you know desperado and like the 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 vignette from that and like the 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 time for for Terry Funk and then also when they were having people throw chairs in the ring if you you pr- maybe seen this clip where there's 30 chairs coming in the ring and next thing you know there's a pile of chairs on top of bodies which got out of control but just like a, a crazy moment in professional wrestling history and then for some reason I always remember when he came out to help mankind, you know, in that hell in a cell and, you know, Undertaker picks him up and choke slams him out of his shoes and he like seizes on the ground. And uh, maybe another one, Timmy, and this will be my last one where he was chainsaw Charlie and he was with mankind, or I think he was cactus Jack at the time. And they had a feud with the new age outlaws. 
And the New Age Outlaws put them in a dumpster. And then they push the dumpster off the side of the uh, the Jumbotron. Do you remember that? I don't. Oh, man. Classic moment from the Attitude Era. But Terry Funk, that's what that's what you got to say. I mean, Attitude Era, the, the nah. ruthless aggression, the ECW, WCW, <laughs> A, you know, all these NWA. Like, this guy has been around for decades and just a true legend. R.I.P. to Terry Funk. Three. Three quick things. Yes. I know I told you I wasn't going to talk about Terry Funk because I didn't really know him, but I just remembered three quick things. Um, Number one, Cody Rhodes tribute to uh, Terry Funk on Raw, I believe it was last week, was excellent. He called him a cowboy. He talked about, you know, his meaning to obviously wrestling and um, again, Raw does such a great job, and I think they flew out Cody, or I think it was during SmackDown, actually. Yeah. It was during SmackDown. Yeah, they flew, flew out Cody to do his little little speech on uh, on SmackDown. Um, and then the one thing was the, uh, the ladder on the neck, like when he yes. does like this. Yes, that was like, ECW. That was, that was Terry Funk's, like, big thing, right? Like, yes. Him, like, Absolutely, I remember clear, that. I'm glad you brought that up. That just jogged the memory. You're right. Clearing the ring and just in knocking everybody out, like that was a uh, that was a cool thing. And then last thing, I saw a uh, a interview with the Blue Meanie, who was an ECW guy, uh, WWE guy, and blue, the Blue Meanie talked about how Terry Funk um, welcomed him into the ECW. And he, he said that, like, he was – I saw this on Crossing Broad, that he was, like, nervous to approach him and stuff like that. And, like, Terry Funk, like, came out to him. He was like, yeah, you, you're the Blue Meanie, right? Like, you should – uh he's like, you know what you should do? He's like, you should go down, like, to, the, like, the local junkyard and buy, like, some, like, blue piece of shit car and just, like, show up in, like, a, a blue car and just, like, just embrace, like, the whole blue thing. And he was like – He's like, dude, I'm sitting here talking to this legend, like Terry Funk. And like, this guy has been doing this for years and he's telling me, he's giving me all these character ideas. Yeah. And I'm a nobody like, and That's awesome. He just is giving me all this insight on like how I can develop my character and stuff like that. It was kind of cool to hear the blue mini talk about that. And hopefully one day we'll have him on our show and, Maybe he can share that story, but it was uh, it was cool to hear him talk about that whole situation. Yeah, so. and just the stories coming out, it seems like Terry Funk was one of the nicest guys, one of the best guys in the wrestling industry. And I don't think you last as long as you do without being that type of like a Terry Funk. So, R.I.P. to Bray Wyatt and to Terry Funk. And you know, our thoughts are with your your families, and obviously these uh the sad times for you but what a legacy both of these guys have left and the legacy of both of them being great on the mic and i want to go right now timmy to two guys that might be the best on the mic in wwe right now we're going to get into payback and the card here and the first match that i've circled is la Knight versus the miz and their promos that they've been doing the last couple of weeks, Tim, have been great. The build to this match has been short, but very good. Like, I've really enjoyed when these guys come on TV talking about the needle moving, talking about I'm not changing the channel. I want to see these guys put on the show. And without even fighting these last two shows, these guys have been entertaining as hell. It's been well, great. You know, what's great too, Tom, is that. They both, um, look, LA Knight has never been the guy, right? And now he's starting to get a lot of momentum. And then this has been the guy before, but guess what? That LA Knight has now brought back to life, he has resuscitated the Miz, and the Miz is now relevant again because of LA Knight, and right. It's ironic how that works, right? These these two guys um who look, the Miz was a real world guy, right? And he 
you know, he went into development and you know, obviously he, he worked his way up and like he had somewhat of a meteoric rise, right? He was already a celebrity and and he's pushed into this limelight now and he's embraced his character as like the Miz and uh he's this LA celebrity star and like yeah. now now he's he's basically looking at himself in the mirror with LA Knight. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It's a cool dynamic in how it works. Um and I don't know. Look, we we have speculated about LA Knight for for a while. Like is this guy like we wanted him to get over. He's been over. He's getting a push now and we want to see what he does with this push. Um this is a good first test. I think he's passing it with fly, flying colors. Let's see how the match goes. There's probably going to be a lot of mic work before the match even starts, right? Yeah. Um, it'll uh, be fun. You think, you think they're going to give him mic work before it starts? I mean, I could see backstage interviews to kind of get a little. Yeah, I think there's going to be some. There's got to be some build up to it. Like, I, I can't imagine they have two of the best guys. Like, look. I mean, the Rock and Triple H, the Rock and Stone Cold. Whenever they did, their their I'm not comparing these guys to to them, but like they they always any opportunity they gave them a mic, yeah, they would take it every every advantage, yeah. and go at it. So, well, right now these are probably the two best guys on the mic, maybe in the in all of WWE, and it's entertaining every time. So, I would love to see a little. You know, you you have a, a match, a couple matches go on, and in between, after the first match, you get a little interview with L.A. Knight and The Miz, and uh, people get to watch that, you know, them talk about what they're going to do going out there, and yeah. it leads to them fighting later on in the card. So I'm really looking forward to this match. I've loved the promos. I like how The Miz is, a, a like, no holds bar attacked L.A. Knight for, he's, he's calling him a ripoff of the Attitude Era, and, He's saying, yeah, what? But yeah, like it's basically the same thing. And um, you know, saying that he's ripping off all these guys and an LA Knight saying, like, yeah, I'm gonna be a flash in the pan, but you're never what you're you're talking about something from 12 years ago and good on you. But you were always even even when you had a stunt double, he was the star. You know what I mean? Like I, like they're they're hitting each other with heavy duty stuff, and it's pretty great. I love I love it. It's entertaining. Um <laughs> I hope they keep keep with it. I mean, I don't know if they can, if this is going to be like a uh, a one match deal and then it's over and then and then he moves on to the next thing. It would be cool if they they could kind of feud for for a little while, but like there's just no there's no end game for La Knight, right? They like to keep on feuding with Miz. This is kind of like you can see, like this is like his stepping stone. Right. And the Miz seems like he's willing to kind of play that role right now for him. And it's going to be he's playing a good role and and it's it's working really well. Yeah, it almost reminds me a little bit of Stone Cold. And um, the only thing is that Miz doesn't have a belt. I feel like it would help if the Miz did have a belt. But it almost reminds me of Stone Cold and Owen Hart back in the day when they were yeah. feuding in the build to Stone Cold eventually becoming the wwe champion and i wonder and i guess that's the big question is what height can la knight go to you know and as far as his character and on mic i mean sky's the limit right now i have some concerns about his in the ring i would like to see something some foul play maybe go on here and really get people up against Miz and, and cheering for LA night. So maybe a disqualification of some sorts and a beat down or um, Miz wins by some, some, some sort of underhanded way setting up for the next match and eventually the payoff of LA night winning against the Miz and then moving on. But I feel Let like me... this feud is just starting and I wouldn't stop it until probably survivor series. Let me ask you about um, BFT. Blunt, blunt force trauma, the finishing move. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, I love it. You don't like it? Well, I mean, it's just, it's just so simple, right? To correlate that to the stunner. It's like and a stunner slash RKO. Yeah, it's so. It's like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking you, like, hey, look, 
if we're if we're going to make this guy mainstream, have we? Is there any evidence of of mainstream guys, right? Like guys like you know Stone Cold or Edge or any of these guys, right? Like that have have changed their finishing move at all? Like, do you think like he needs a change, or do you do you like the BFT? Because I just as much as like the Miz is killing him for being like a attitude error guy, like the BFT is very attitude error esque, if you will. I don't think Do he th- needs to change a thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kevin Owens does the stunner. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. these Edge's finishing move was the spear, which Goldberg made popular before Edge was doing it. You know, so like, you know, uh. What's his name? Booker T was talking about how everybody in wrestling takes from everybody. No, else. I get that. I get that. But I'm my my question is that like, look, they're tapping in. They're clearly doing this on purpose, right? Tapping into like the attitude era, right? With with L.A. Knight. Yeah. But how yeah. far? How <laughs> yeah yeah? How far do you go until you push it too far, and then they go, yeah, this dude's just carbon copy, right? That's all I'm worried about. Is just like all right, well, that's like, on L.A. That's on L.A., and I think he's done a good job of being his own man. And, you know, this stuff like Papa Don't Take No Met, like, I love that. You know what I mean? I, I think he's been great. And if you can, if there's parallels to that Attitude Era and those guys like Stone Cold, you said, you know, I feel like he's an original character. You know, I think it's kind of got tones of that, but with his own twist on it. I, I have no problem with L.A. Knight. I love yeah. it. I think they're dancing. I think they're dancing on the line a little bit with the way they, um, they're letting the Miz attack him. And you're right. You know, it's a, it's an opportunity for him to defend himself and say how he's different. So it's up to the character to really, you know, deliver on that type of, you know, attack. So, I mean, I hope, I hope, I hope he delivers well. Um, I just, I hope it doesn't get kind of misconstrued and he gets like kind of typecast and then yeah, you know, he falls into the oblivion, if you what will. What needs that is. what needs to happen for LA Knight to really take that next step is he needs to have a five star match, man. He needs to have a match that is like, wow, what a match. When you think about Stone Cold and his rise, what really started him on that like total catabol? He had the character that Austin three sixteen says, "I'm going to whip your ass," but he was a great worker in the ring until his neck was broken, and he he still was good after that. He had to change his style to more of a brawler. But when he won the the King of the Ring, and then that lead up to facing Bret Hart, and in his matches with Bret Hart, I mean WrestleMania thirteen matches maybe the greatest match of all time, and he gets busted. If you look at that match, it's just so good from start to finish. And you can really see what stone cold was in ring prior to that neck injury. And it's a shame he had the neck injury because he was one of the best in ring going at the time, but LA Knight needs to be able to do something to tell the story in the ring. I really hope they're, they're walking around the ring. How can we put this into here? How can we, kind of create a little moment here, a little moment there, and really get this crowd building to a frenzy. And then foul play. And let's not give them the, the that that let's not give them the payoff yet. And let's get another match out of this at, at let the feud build. I, I would love to see LA Knight and Miz going at each other on the mic and different like and, and bring in some of those different crazy scenarios like an attitude era where you got the the beer truck in your sprains. You know what I mean? Like Let's do some shit in here, like some fun shit with this, and they they could do it. And and the, he has to put on the in ring match. It has to be top notch. Because remember, we were really pumped for his match with Bray Wyatt, but I feel like it was kind of a letdown at the Royal Rumble. You know what I mean? So I'm excited for this match. It has to deliver, but I think it's the step. It's the first step in their feud to multiple matches. If that makes sense. You like that? You think that's a good idea? Whatever you said was perfect, Tom. Perfect. <laughs> now you sound like my wife. All right. So 
Another big match, and let's get on this one, and we'll talk about it. This, I, Timmy, I want to put a time limit on this. Let's get a minute each, and we're going to start your clock after I'm done the question. We got Rey Mysterio versus Austin Theory. Timmy, are you looking forward to this match, and who do you think gets the win? And go. I think uh, Rey Mysterio holds the title. Um, I, I truly believe that the next champion of the U S title is going to be who the guy that we just spoke 10 minutes about, um, is LA Knight, And I think that's going to be the route that it goes. Um, Austin theory needs to start a new with like a different, I think he needs to go after the world heavy heavyweight championship. Um, and who knows how that plays out, but I think, I think, uh, I said earlier is going to happen. All right. So we think Aus- or Ray Mysterio holds on and that's going to be setting up to LA Knight winning the match. You know, I think that theory wins this match. I think they put it back on him and somehow this leads to a chase with someone else getting, but if Ray Mysterio does win, like you're saying, any chance that the Miz then swoops in somehow and gets a match against, say he he gets a a, a win against L.A. Knight, not in really the best way, and he swoops in and, and steals the L, uh, United States title, kind of leading to that feud with him and and putting the belt on L.A. Knight that way. That's a step. So that's your classic one step backwards, two steps forward. So like that's. I mean, it's it's not a bad theory. Um, I just don't know if, if the the way that they're building LA Knight, I don't know if they can withstand a step backwards with him. I think he's just on such a rise that like any any like he need, he doesn't have a PLE win. He doesn't have a major PLE win. They just got him over with like Finn Balor. Like Finn Balor just. Dropped one at SmackDown to him, which was like surprising to me. It was a clean win. I was blown away by that. Um, which tells me that if they're gonna let Finn Balor, who's trying to build himself up in the judgment day as a serious contender, and they don't they're gonna let him take a fall to LA Knight, that means that LA Knight's gonna win clean somewhere, somehow, some way at a fucking pay-per-view. So the Miz is not going to going to win this match, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I I just don't feel like this feud is done on on Saturday. So I just I feel like somehow you have the Miz or or just like a double DQ. You know what I mean? Where something happens and nobody wins, and you get a double DQ to keep. Because on on next week's SmackDown, I want to see the Miz and LA Knight going at it. it and it is funny to me that. One of these guys was drafted to Raw and another was drafted to SmackDown, but here we are, right? But, uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking about Finn Balor and him being kind of like a stepping stone anymore. It's it's bizarre that this guy just seems to be like, all right, we're going to start to get someone over. What we're going to have them do is face Finn Balor, and they'll beat him. And uh, Finn will be the big fight for them, and then he'll beat him, and that'll be the first step in kind of catapulting this thing. So... Big match this weekend. We got KO and Sami Zayn versus Finn and Damian, two guys that are clearly not on the same page in the same faction. Um, you've got the uh, JD McDonough, who's been friends with Finn for a long time, now kind of on the outskirts of the Judgment Day and seems to be trying to help them out. He helped Damian Priest get a win this week against Sami Zayn. What are your predictions for this match? I'm saying that Finn and Damian find a way to win with JD McDonough helping out because, I mean, as much as I love KO and Sami Zayn, I think you got to take the titles off of these guys and and move them on to something else and and get the titles to where other tag teams can can go for it. So I've been saying this from day one, and you can go back through our history here and listen to the show. I knew that that KO and Sammy would have a short range just because they're better off. Like they're better off individually. They are better as individuals 
coming up through the ranks than they are as a tag team. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to throw more gold towards the judgment day. Right. So now everyone has a belt at this point. And then the HJB brought up a great point with the money in the bank situation and Shinsuke and, and it, it just sets up really well um, with Seth Rollins where, look, he might win the champ, the, the tag team championship and, at the same time, like they they've been dragging on this this back injury with Seth Rollins, they've identified that, and I don't see Seth, I don't see Shinsuke as the World Heavyweight Championship or the World Heavy Heavyweight Championship title holder moving forward. I can see Damian Priest sneaking in. And and using that money in the bank briefcase and taking it off of either Shinsuke or Seth Rollins whenever that match is over because it's going to be the main event. Now, do you think they get the win for the tag belts and then he cashes in and gets the main? So we got Finn and Damian. We both agree Finn and Damian win this tag melt belts and then you see a cash in for now. What about this? This just popped in my head, and this is kind of silly. What if KO and Sami Zayn are fighting Finn and Damian, right? And they're fighting for the titles, and KO and Sami win. Out comes J.D. McDonough, and he's like beating, and they're beating them down. And next thing you know, KO and Sami Zayn are laid out and beat down. And Damian says, I'm cashing in for the tag titles right now. Not happening. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why? You can cash in for any championship you want. And Why he cashes would... in and he says to Finn, look, I'm he, cashing oh, in for these tag belts. He had a dream of being a tag team title holder. I don't know. It, yeah, yeah no, I, I don't know. Stop. I mean, sometimes they don't think about Come you think on. Austin Theory had the dream of being the United States champion and not the heavyweight champion when he cashed in. It's 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 storyline. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not buying it. Just an idea. Just throwing it out there. But so you're saying that Damien and Finn win the tag belts later on in the match. Maybe Seth wins or Shinsuke wins. Someone wins and they're beat up. Out comes Damien Priest in the Judgment Day. He cashes in his Money in the Bank contract. And now Damien Priest walks out with the WWE Heavyweight Championship and half of the Tag Team Championships. And so then you've got two guys in yep. a faction, both holding the tag belts, and then you have one guy just green with envy looking at the other one because he wants that championship belt more than anything. That's a pretty good story. Yeah, I think it's a great storyline. I think it's awesome. It creates turmoil within the Judgment Day. Um, Mommy has to do her best to control all of her boys. And then now you look at it, and every single member of Judgment Day holds a title. I think it's awesome, and and I think this back storyline is something to give Seth a break. I think he's going to get like a two month break where he goes away for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to get hurt during this match, and he's going to drop the title to Shinsuke. And I think. Uh, it would suck that Shinsuke will get like three three seconds to hold the title. If that's the case, he wins the title and then all of a sudden he loses it to Dingy Priest. But um I think that's the way it's gonna go down. I think I I love what the H A B has brought up. I the more I think about it, I think the more it heads in that direction. All right. So you think Shinsuke beats Seth? Seth gets a little bit of time off. I mean, Seth is a front runner, and if he needs the time off to get healthy, and and that's a possibility to to go into the build to WrestleMania, the road to WrestleMania, and like particularly around Royal Rumble season and a little bit before, if he needs that amount of time off, I mean, you you have to give it to someone, especially for a back injury, because he's a front runner for someone that can take the titles off of Roman Reigns, you know, and. That's someone that is right at the top of a storyline. Him and Cody, I would say, 
are probably the two top guys that if you're going to say this is the person taking the belts off of Roman, it's either Seth or Cody right now. Does that do you, do you agree with that? No, yeah, no. I, I mean, I've said it from the start that Cody is the guy that has to take it off of Roman. Um, he's not going to take the world heavyweight championship from Seth because that's not that's not how he finishes the story. I think it, it has to be the universal championship from Roman Reigns. And that's the only way he finishes the story. The bloodline is completely removed from, from the WWE right now, which is a nice break. Um, so you have these other storylines that are going to play out and you got to see who's going to step up to the plate. Honestly, it's a, it's a great, like kind of trial by error type situation. Like, Hey, listen, we've been riding this storyline for a year for three years we're gonna put it to a side to the side let's see who can deliver now and lightly put it to the side jimmy I will think- be on smackdown this week and you know it's but it's not they're not main eventing well, this ple not- which has been you know yeah it's been it's been a while since right. we've seen the bloodline, right? They haven't really been front and center, right? Like Jay, Jimmy, Roman. Yeah, Roman's getting his cake schedule, and I'm sure all the other wrestlers are pretty pissed off about it. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think that's part of the, you know, he, he's been the, the workhorse before, and I feel like you earn some things, and people can't, you know, Seth maybe can be, disgruntled about it you know guys that have been there for a long time Seamus could be disgruntled about it you know but uh something that has been brought up and as we're on the topic of Roman Reigns is kind of a lot of stuff talked about how his matches play out and how they work and they seem to be very similar you know they wrestle and then Solo interferes and helps out and he gets the win and you know so on and so on it just seems to be happening all the time and I think the next match that Roman has needs to be a clean win for him. Clearly, he's not going to win it. He's not going to lose at the next PLE, you know, his belt. I I can't imagine he would lose it before a WrestleMania. And if he's going to go into be in a match, I feel like he needs to win it straight up, you know, and kind of get some matches. The, The next couple matches before WrestleMania under his belt is just winning He's Roman Reigns and he wins, you know, he'd be kind of just that dominant wrestler that that is been the the tribal chief and the champ. And shout out to Roman Reigns. Officially now, I believe it's three years as as of today, three years as the uh, WWE champion. Yeah, three years and uh, what? Seven title defenses, I think. Total. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Now, you see, you don't remember the days of Brock Lesnar holding the title and being gone for a while. And this is what the CM Punk marks would say about when CM Punk and Brock were going after for the longest reign as the, you know, champion and like the holding the belt in the modern kind of era that, oh, look at all the title defenses and stuff like that. Like, yes, I, I understand that sometimes. But we, we need a break from him right now. You know what I mean? So he just defended it at SummerSlam. He's defended it at uh, WrestleMania. I don't know the time before. He's uh, whatever. So <laughs> Roman, Roman, I, 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 uh, I've been a Roman defender for oh. a long time. But so let's get into um, real quickly the match of the night. Becky Lynch versus Trish Stratus steel cage match. We're really looking forward to this one. I don't think we've gotten enough Becky and Trish. The more Becky and Trish we can get, the better. I hope that this is just the 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 maybe the midpoint of their feud. Tim, what do you think? Well, if we if this doesn't settle it, um, I mean they they probably need to do the uh, the cowbell match. <laughs> um, I mean, what other what what else can we do with with these two? Would I get canceled um, if you said a, a bra and panties match would be? A... <laughs> now that would be the match. Am I right, Tim? You are right, um, dude. So the one thing that I just saw, oh, uh, and I think you were on the same text line, uh, Bully Ray. 
came out and said, like, look, dude, it's time for her to maybe step away for a little while. And I would agree, dude. I just don't know what what is. And she's a big draw. And I just don't. I don't get it. I just don't get what she's doing right now. I don't get the whole Trish Strass stuff. Like I, I've been watching for over a year and change now, and it seems like she just keeps falling down the ladder. And I don't know what 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 else is left for her. Yeah, he mentioned that, and you He's- said that she's a big draw. And I don't necessarily even believe she's a big draw anymore. I have no interest in this match. And you were talking about what Bully Ritz, Ray said. He said he need she needs what she's always needed, which is Charlotte Flair. And Charlotte Flair has carried that rivalry. I love Charlotte Flair. She's the GOAT, in my opinion, as of right now. Now there's some other wrestlers coming up there in the women's division that are incredible that i love and we're going to talk about that match going into uh going into payback but this feud has been lost i think becky lynch has been lost and i totally agree with with what bully has said what tim you agree with what bully said she needs some time away she's lost that that shine you know what i'm saying i just don't know if like that the booking has been great for her like i just don't like zoe stark she seems good. I don't know. Like she, I remember like Zoe, like uh, not Zoe Stark. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Becca Lynch has been like really, dude. She's been like forefront, like ESPN. Like she was like a big time. Like she was doing commercials and all that other stuff, and like now. It just doesn't feel authentic, right? Like it just feels fake a little bit, and and everything that she's done. Maybe, maybe that's the route you go with her. Like maybe, maybe you go like, hey, like listen, like she has the big time Bex thing. Maybe, maybe you take that Hollywood thing and say like, hey, you went too far with it, and you develop your her character like that as a like someone that just got too big for who she is and then try to build her back up. Yeah. You you know, they probably, they probably give her a lot of leeway, a lot of slack into what she can and can't do. But, you know, I feel like that shine is off. And before when she had it, she probably had her merch sales very high. The man t-shirt was in demand. Um, But, yeah, it's just fallen off for me, and I feel like the talent around her has gone up, and she's stayed the same. You know, you got a, a girl like Raquel Rodriguez, who is incredible in the ring. Rhea Ripley, mommy, is as good as it gets. Bianca Belair in ring. Becky Lynch can't touch her. Charlotte's still the GOAT, you know, and, I, you know, Becky Lynch, maybe somehow, some way. She needs to start giving back and putting over these young, uh, younger female wrestlers and showing them the ropes, similar to like a John Cena with his United States title reign. I don't know if she's going to stick around. I, I've, I've never been on the Becky Lynch train, you know, but we'll see what happens with this match. I'm assuming Becky Lynch is going to win. Um, if not, I'm going to be questioning where's the, uh, thank you, Trish tattoo that was promised in the uh in the fight and if they're if they're not going to do that uh but this is going to be a a bathroom break match for me you know what i mean the steel cage adds a little bit of an element to it but other than that i'm not i'm not super interested but i i'm I'm interested on the uh the ria versus raquel rodriguez match and now i think Looking at this card, I feel like this is the match you start the show with. I think you start with Rhea, Mommy versus Raquel. You got the crowd going. Like, it's it's about to start, and Mommy's music hits, and boom. You know, the place is ready. You give them a little bit of time. And I'm telling you, these women can put on a show. I've seen, you know, I, I, I remember. Would you, who would you have? Who would I what? 
Who would you? Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I shouldn't interrupt you. No, uh, go ahead. God, keep. No, Timmy. Who would I what? I, I go on. Go ahead. No, no, no. I understand. What, I understand what you're saying. Um, with her, but like, I was thinking, like, dude, like, if you want, because this match has a better build, in my opinion, than than the Shinsuke Seth Rollins match. And if you're gonna make uh a, a women's match the main, main event, event match, uh, I think it's not a bad idea. Be because then, it, 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 you know, what's so funny is it's like a strategic move for WWE, and they can say, "Hey, look, PLE main event women's match, we did it." You know, like it can it can be something that they can tote. Their, but I don't think know. that. See, I I don't think that the WWE is in that in that game. Like they're, in my opinion, they would go like, "Look, if if it's Vince McMahon." Right. And we're talking about Vince. And they're putting all these numbers out about Wembley Stadium. Vince McMahon goes to Penn State and goes, Hey, guess what? Uh payback is at <laughs> is at you know PSU this weekend and they'll Summer sell slam. out. Next year is at Penn but, State. Well, I mean, my point is like they'll like you you're telling me that that like if if the WWE decided to go to Penn State, right? And said, "Hey, I'm putting on a show in a- April, right?" Yeah. It's the end of the college year. You tell me they wouldn't sell that fucking place out? They wouldn't sell out Beaver Stadium? Oh yeah, they would. 100 and they would sell out 105,000 people. It would be easy. What's the biggest what's the biggest stadium out. in in the country? What's the biggest stadium in the world? Cuz Vince is probably looking at that right Prob- now. <laughs> yeah, that's what How I'm saying. How do I create it's... the most seats possible to sell to set this record that's just basically unbreakable for the for the for the near right. future? It's 80 so 81,000 is the number and Vince is probably like fuck that, right? He wants to go to Michigan. Yeah. Right. Go there oh. or go to Ohio State or anywhere. Like he could he could go anywhere in the United States and get that done. Well, like, apparently, not, like Ed not... Sheeran is breaking all these records at every stadium he's going to because he has like a small stage. Like WWE, if they really want to set the record, they're gonna have to eliminate this huge big screen. And it might be kind of cool to do something like almost like an underground, they come out of like you know, like a like a tunnel kind of feature to where you can maximize the mm-hmm. seats, you know, just for one PLE to to say we're selling a hundred thousand seats, you know. But yeah, he's probably looking for that and and you're you're saying he wants to build but you know, I look at I look at WrestleMania last year. I mean they had two nights in a row with close to 80,000 people both nights. You know what I mean? They had like 160,000 people in two nights. So it's like, you know, there are different levels, clearly. You know, it, it, this this whole thing, I think, and is the more tickets are a, much more expensive. Than yeah, all stuff. right. It's like the whole night. Like, it just, it, it does really kind of annoy me, though. Like, if I was the owner of fucking WWE and I got, Some fucking he was the headliner in the biggest wrestling match in all like of all time. I'd be like, nah, no, nah, you weren't, dude. <laughs> like, and then if if it logistically was accurate, I would do everything I could to change that. You know yeah. what I mean? I'd be like, yeah. fuck this. I'm gonna I'm gonna create an event at the best venue in the world with the most people in the world to watch our guys do something crazy. You know what I mean? So anyway, well, that's what we said earlier. When that's just me. AEW is doing these big numbers. It's just, it's good for wrestling fans all around. You know, it's good for all of professional wrestling because now WWE is going to be like, Oh yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet. And they always got an ace up sure. their sleeve ready to go. Sure. So next week, Stone Cold versus L.A. Knight. Who's the real? 
<laughs> Jesus, that'd be wild. Yeah. But so who do you got winning that Rhea Raquel match? I think Rhea holds on. I feel like she's going to be holding on until the uh until WrestleMania, basically. I love the push that um Raquel's getting. I love what they're trying to build her character into. Um, she's yeah, she's had these injuries and she's been fighting through them and she's wanted to compete. So she's getting like the Philadelphia treatment. Like she's like a dog, right? And she's going to keep on fighting until she gets a shot, which is great. Um, versus the ultimate antagonist who is Rhea, Rhea Ripley. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I doubt that Rhea is going to drop the belt yet. Um, I think if that does happen, it's going to happen after a solid run with the Judgment Day till probably SummerSlam. I, I think they got to push the Judgment Day strength until that point where it's going to turn heavy and they'll, they'll break the whole thing up. I love that, Timmy. And another thing I love is all the people that have been supporting Jabroni Drive, the fastest growing professional wrestling show in all of professional wrestling shows we hope you've enjoyed what we're talking about we're looking forward to payback this weekend from pittsburgh pennsylvania smackdown's going to be in hershey pennsylvania the sweetest place on earth this friday we'll be tuning into that to see what's going on um if you like what we're doing give us a, a like a share a comment be sure to follow and look forward to uh more weekly shows coming out about professional wrestling, particularly WWE. Timmy, anything you want to say to, uh, to the Schmidt and Lavelleites before we, we sign off this week? Yeah, guys, just uh, remember one of my favorite wrestlers, the Berserker. Huff! 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 The Berserker Oof. was certainly one of Oof. the greatest characters in Oof. professional wrestling history. Oof. <laughs> and of all time. Oof. And Oof. you know what? Oof. To all the Berserkers Oof. out there and the Schmidt and Lavelleites, Oof. thanks again for listening. Oof. Until next week, Oof. enjoy Payback. <laughs> enjoy SmackDown. We love you. God bless you. God bless Jabroni Drive. God bless America. Until next week. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Sayonara.